Hi, my name is Dr. Rayshon Ray, aim to speak truth to power, and this is my daily thought. Rape culture is a thing, and it's highly problematic. And boys and men are socialized to embrace it and celebrate it. So when we talk about rape culture, people are like, what is rape culture? Well, see, rape culture is an environment that breeds characteristics that I'll talk about, which increases the likelihood that sexual harassment, sexual assault, and rape will occur through the justification that certain acts are not actually sexual offenses. Things such as grabbing a woman's behind at a club, um, trying to take off someone's clothing, making certain, uh, certain comments like uh, Republican candidate Donald Trump has made that is in, in a sense, sexual harassment and essentially making statements as if he is going to actually sexually assault someone. For several years, I've studied uh, fraternities. The main reason why I've studied fraternities is to look at what, what are the reasons that leads to men treating women a particular way in a sexually objectifying way. And so that's another term. When we talk about sexual objectification, it's, it's essentially sexism, right? So, so I mean, so like when we talk about sexual objectification, it's when an individual is seen as a sexual object and their personality and intellectual abilities are disregarded for their physical and sexual attributes. In turn, their sexual and physical self are totally separated from their holistic and personal self. So they're viewed as an object. Now we have this traditional view of sexual assault. This whole, this person gets out of, um, jumps out of a van in a ski mask or some scary bus and snatches someone off the street. And don't get me wrong. I mean, those sort of things happen, but this is a really traditional, uh, simplistic view of rape. And so what people like to do is people actually like to try to put up signs for registered sex offenders and this sort of thing. The problem though, is that most people are actually sexually assaulted or raped by a person that they know. It's highly problematic. So we have these gray boundaries of sexual assault that becomes highly problematic. When we talk about sexual assault, sexual assault is the actual attempted or threatened sexual contact with another person without their consent. That's essentially what Donald Trump did. Consent has to be freely given and mutually understood. Only yes means yes. And so when I was working at the Office of Women's Affairs at Indiana University, I saw this quite frequently, that these statistics, uh, I mean, really came to bear, that about a third of women um, are sexually assaulted and or raped. Now, about 17% of men are also uh, sexually assaulted and or raped. Um, and these can be in heterosexual or um, individuals who are part of the LGBTQ community, then the same can be for women. Now, this is the problem. Sexual assaults occur about every two minutes. Every two minutes, somebody is sexually assaulted. And again, these sexual assaults normally happens with someone who they know. So this becomes, I mean, just highly problematic. And the other problem, roughly 60% of all sexual assaults are never reported. And sexual assaults, similar to, say, a person being robbed or uh, a home being burglarized, People, women in particular, are no less likely to say that they've been sexually assaulted or raped than uh, a person who has been robbed. So about 98% of the time, a person who has been sexually assaulted or raped is telling the truth. I mean, who actually wants to come out and say that they've been sexually assaulted or raped, giving the stigma that's associated with that. Now, there are some other things at play due to the segregated nature of society, the fact that we live in highly uh, racially segregated and class segregated uh, neighborhoods. Most people are raped by someone who looks like them, who are of the same race. When it comes to the military, about 30 percent of female veterans uh, report being sexually assaulted and or raped. Very similar to college campuses. This is what's interesting. College campuses, now fraternities become a, become a culprit for this. And part of this has to do, similar to the military, similar to sports teams, that men are in power and control a particular setup. I remember doing this study <clears throat> with Jason Rosso, where we were interviewing uh, black and white fraternity men and we were going to parties, we were doing observations, we were essentially following these men around, getting a holistic picture of their lives, what leads to opportunities or what enables them to treat women a particular way? What constrains them? Well, gender ratios was a big one. There were some fraternities who would invite over uh, 
three different sororities. If each sorority has 100 members and the fraternity only has 100 members. So now you have 300 women and 100 men. This becomes a breeding environment where something problematic could happen because they do things like keep a special stash of alcohol upstairs <clears throat> and make it really, really strong. But you can't really taste the alcohol, even though there's all types of alcohol in it, Everclear and vodka and rum and gin. I mean, you name it. And they make women feel special. Oh, come upstairs. We have this special batch upstairs. There was even one incident, one of the most egregious ones. There was a man who walked around with two uh, champagne glasses and a bottle of champagne and walked around and said, who wants to come home with me? And he got pushed. He got uh, cussed out. Women were like, leave me alone. But by the end of the night, he was walking out with someone and essentially dragging that woman out of the fraternity house. So we see the way that when men control certain environments, and this is the big thing that people have been trying to figure out about Trump. <clears throat> and First Lady Michelle Obama mentioned this. Donald Trump is a powerful man as it relates to status. He has money. He has resources. Part of having money and resources is, as he said, unfortunately, he is able to take advantage of people in ways that other people cannot. This is the reason why fraternity men on campus, um, whether that be uh, certain uh, military personnel, uh, certain individuals who are part of athletic teams. And there, there are a host of other places. This could be bosses uh, at a company such as the, uh, the dean of the law school at Berkeley. And the list could go on and on. Uh, professors taking advantage of students. It happens in various ways. And it's normally a huge power differential at play. All right. And so when we talk about men and boys and the way that they're socialized, men are often told that it's necessary to be sexually dominating. So part of it is being more powerful. Part of being dominating is controlling and exploiting others. In other words, real men always get laid. As a result, sexual assault, date rape and relationship violence are destroying our lives. And so our culture is so, uh, is so sexualized that many of us are desensitized to pornography. But research professionals have shown that pornography has the same addictive qualities as cocaine. And of course, having access on mobile phones doesn't make things better. So what this leads to is that on a regular basis, men can see women on a sexual auction block, literally. They can have access to women. They can exploit women with their phones, taking pictures, doing these sorts of things. They start to view sex as a game where they actually need to conquer women. And in certain advertisements and things we see on TV, it suggests that, that men have easy access to women and that we can actually coerce women into doing things such as by drinking alcohol, uh, by doing different things, by making uh, things more susceptible. So alcohol is oftentimes used. Uh, sexual violence is oftentimes trivialized. So it doesn't become, oh, then I'm filling her up or filling on her without her permission. Instead, men are actually socialized that we have ownership over women's bodies. This is part of sexually objectifying women. So we start to see sexual violence and different things like that. So what's interesting is that what people don't realize is that you don't have to necessarily talk to your children or try to push rape or sexually assault on your boys. But instead, boys become socialized to do so. So we actually have to work to debunk those particular uh, images and narratives about what's going on. So Donald Trump, when he says this is only locker room banter, uh, no, that's not true because your attitudes become directly linked to your behaviors. So what you say when you say that you're going to grab a woman in her coochie, you have probably done that at some point in time or else you wouldn't be saying it. And I've been in a lot of locker rooms and don't get me wrong. Most of the guys in locker rooms are not talking like that, but there are always a few who make certain comments like that. And what happens is some people are silent. Some people laugh. Other people try to not pay attention. Very few people are speaking up and speaking out and saying, hey, man, that's not cool. You, you can't talk like that. So then it becomes something where people's silence becomes their acceptance. So although it's not, say, pervasive in a locker room, it becomes part of the culture whereby those certain statements do actually come up. And so what happens is that sexual, sexual assault can never be justified. It is still rape if a victim is unconscious or drunk. So when we have the Stanford swimmer raping a woman behind a dumpster, his friends, his fraternity brothers, his teammates said that they had seen that happen several times before in terms of him interacting with women in a very similar way, right? So it is rape if the victim is even dressed like a slut. This is what I tell my students. 
or actually when I travel around and I talk to talk to male groups. If you're at a nudie beach where people don't wear clothes, does it give you the right to go up to somebody and start feeling on them? Of course not. So what gives you the right to do it? No matter what a woman has on, it doesn't matter how short her shorts are, even if she doesn't have on shorts. It doesn't matter if she is only walking around with a bra or in a see-through shirt and doesn't have on a bra. It doesn't give you the right to touch her body because you do not own her body compared to the way that we've been socialized to think about it. So see, sexual abu abuse can also occur if people have previously consented. We used to have laws on the books that said once people got married that a woman did not have the right to, to not consent to sex with her husband. Well, in a lot of states, this has changed. This is highly problematic. So sexual abuse can actually occur even in marriage. Men can be victims and women can also be perpetrators, even though it's normally the other way around. And just because a sexual assault or rape is not proven in court, in the court of law, doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And unfortunately, it can happen to everyone. So in several of these cases, we have women being paid off to essentially be quiet uh, by universities. They're being paid off by universities. So individuals are never to blame for being sexually assaulted and or raped. Rapists rather than survivors are ultimately responsible. So for men, look, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, our friends, our girlfriends, and our friend girls. So we have to also speak up for our fathers, our brothers, our sons, and our male friends. See, speaking out doesn't just quote unquote save women. It also saves men from the psychological effects of being perceived as perpetrators. So speaking up and speaking out also leads to building bridges between men and women to serve and actually try to debunk the cycle of relationship violence and sexual exploitation that plagues so many families that we know, including our own. So speaking up and speaking out, you can do simple things like say, dude, that's not cool. Make your presence known like your physical presence in a situation. If your friends engage in these behaviors against your will, then they're not really your friends. And you should have an obligation. As a matter of fact, you do have an obligation to report it. So look, this is my daily thought. Conversations matter like black lives and books, and I hope this has sparked one.